بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أحمده وأستعينه وأؤمن به وأتوكل عليه ثم أصلي وأسلم على خاتم أنبيائه وأفضل سفرائه المحمود الأحمد المصطفى الأمجد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين والحجة على الخلائق أجمعين المهدي المنتظر فداه أرواح العالمين The third precondition for salat is the purity of the body and clothing. Now, the exception is clothing in which salat is not accepted in without other pieces of clothing. So non-essential articles of clothing. For example, because you can't pray naked whilst wearing a pair of socks, these socks aren't essential. So if your socks aren't pure, if they're nejis, it's okay, you can pray with them. And it's the same case with other pieces of clothing that are not essential. So hats, gloves, belts, these things, as long as they're not made from something that is inherently nejis, for example, the leather of pigs, or from the leather of a cow or sheep or any other animal that isn't slaughtered in the proper Islamic way. Now, the exception to the rule that says you can't pray in clothing that is najis or if your body is najis is, well, there are, a few ex uh, there are a few exceptions. The first one is if you have an open wound. If you have an open wound and there's blood around it or on your body as a result of this open wound, it's okay, you can pray with that. And it doesn't matter how much blood there is on your clothes or on your body. However, it must be a serious open wound. So if someone has blood on their clothing or on their body as a result of a zit that they had popped and there's blood oozing out, that's not a serious wound. You need to wash that off and then pray. The second exception is if you're, let's say if you're a nurse and there's blood stains on your body, if the amount of blood on your body, so it's not from an open wound, it's, it could be someone else's blood. If the amount of blood on your clothing or on your body is, less, is collectively less than the top of your thumb, so I, I counted about maybe two or three centimeters in diameter, if it's less than this amount, it's okay, you can pray with it. However, there are different bloods so if you have any questions, you could either check it up online or you could ask me. Now, if someone didn't know, if someone knows that there's blood stains on their clothes, then they can't pray in it. If they do, they need to redo their prayer. They have to repeat it. However, if they didn't know there, that there was blood on their clothing, or they checked for blood and they couldn't find any, and they prayed, if they found out and realized in the middle of their prayer, and, was, and were able to take that article of clothing off, then they have to do that. But if they couldn't do that, then their, uh, the, then their salat is valid. However, if they knew that there was blood stains on their, on their clothes and they prayed anyways, then their salat is invalid. Or if they were confused, they weren't sure if there's blood on their clothes or not, and they couldn't bother to check, then they realized later on that there was a stain of blood on their clothes or their body, their salat is invalid, they're going to have to repeat it. The second, sorry, the fourth precondition for salah is regarding the place on which you pray. So the thing that you pray on or the place that you pray in, it needs to be licit. In other words, it needs to be either your own property or someone else's property that has given you permission to pray there or on that carpet. If you didn't know that this property was stolen, either this prayer mat or this house that you're praying in, if you didn't know it was stolen, it was someone else's property, and you prayed there, 
then your salah is valid. However, this is only true for other, other than the thief himself. So let's say someone is a thief and all he does is he steals prayer mats. If he prays on a random prayer mat, not knowing whether or not this is his or a stolen one, and then he realizes later on that this prayer mat was uh, stolen, his prayer is invalid, he will need to repeat it. The other thing is about the purity of the place that he prays on. So you, the place that you stand on and you pray needs to be tahir, needs to be uh, pure if it's wet. But if it's not wet, if it's dry, then it's okay. It doesn't need to be tahir. This is true with the exception of the place that you put your forehead on. The place that you put your forehead on needs to be tahir. Wet or dry, no exceptions. This concludes the ahkam of tonight. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم ولقد أرسلنا إلى أمم من قبلك فأخذناهم بالبأساء والضراء لعلهم يتضرعون and we have sent to nations before you then we seized them with tribulations with hardships and poverty and poverty so that they may be humble We've all seen this scene either in movies or real life that when somebody's heart starts to beat irregularly or too slow or too fast or just stops beating completely, what they do is they use a device called a defibrillator. This device very painfully shocks this person's heart and what it does is it resets the heart back to factory settings. Something that's very similar to this is done to babies that are born and they can't breathe normally. What they do is that they grab this delicate small baby and they put him or her inside a warm towel and they rub the baby vigorously. Although it seems like it's a very harsh thing to do to a baby, it's important. It's for his own good. Something that is less done in medicine, in modern medicine, more of the things that we see on movies is, they, is that they slap people who are unconscious. What it does, again, it shocks their system. This is an important thing. It's for their own good. Now, if we take this to our spiritual life, it's very important. Sometimes, when we're very far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we have forgotten God and we have forgotten that He is our creator He rules this world sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shocks our spiritual system and this is very important again although it seems like a harsh thing to do it's actually a very important thing it's for our own good so how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this? The hadith from the Prophet says, If it wasn't for these three things that mankind goes through, nothing would make him bow his head in humility. What are these three things? Sickness, death, and poverty. Again, although it seems like it's a harsh thing to do. It's for our own good. It's actually the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because, again, it gives us a reality check. It makes us do more good. And there's no contradiction between this and free will. Free will is there because we as Muslims, we say that each able, sane, and cognizant adult has free will. You get to choose whether you go to heaven or hell. But Allah, out of His infinite mercy, He tries to pull you out of the mud. But if you keep on taking yourself deeper and deeper into mud, then He will leave you. And this is free will. So this is how God 
tries to make us do more good. There's actually a, an interesting story. There's a hadith that says Musa, Prophet Musa ala nabina wa alihi wa alayhi salam was walking alongside a beach. And while he was walking, he saw the body of a dead person. This man had been eaten in his lower half by sharks and his upper half had been eaten by vultures. And one of the characteristics of the believers, this is in between parentheses, is that they try to take lessons from everything they see. Try to look for morals in every situation. He asked Allah, he says, what happened to this guy? Allah says, this person asked me to give him your status in heaven. And there was no way that I could give him that status except for let him, letting him be like this. The other story, also an interesting story, there was a documentary about this lady a few months ago. This lady wasn't uber religious. In her youth, she became a doctor and she met a person that she wanted to get married to. He was also a doctor. She got married to him. A few months or years later, they had a child, a boy. Then a while later, the man started feeling unwell. They took him to the, to the hospital and it turned out that he had terminal cancer. A few years later, he passed away. So the only memory that she had of her husband was this little boy. And the boy, given that his mom and his dad were both doctors, he had his life set out for him. And in fact, he was doing really well. He got really good grades and he got a scholarship to go to one of the most prestigious schools in the US. He went there, he graduated, and he got a doctorate in medicine. He came back to his hometown and he was just getting ready for his new life when, again, he felt um, unwell. They took him to a doctor, and you guessed it, it turned out he had terminal cancer. And later on, he passed away. And although this sounds like a terrible thing to happen to a mother, this was, in fact, very, very good for her. What happened is it completely turned her life upside down. Suddenly, she took all her money, and she was a wealthy woman. She took all her money, and she made and built the most prestigious hospital that specializes in the type of cancer that took away her husband and her son. She took her mansion, and she turned it into a makeshift hotel for the relatives of the sick to stay in while their relatives get treatment. So it's these things where we see the crossroads between Allah's infinite mercy and His wisdom. So we understand this, that God puts us through difficulty and hardship to elevate our status. But the question is, can we reach high levels of Iman without going through trials and tribulations? The answer is yes. How? It is to maintain a good relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because now that we understand that God only does these things to us to, to become more believing and better people, why don't we do the second step? Why don't we start from the second step? Why don't we start from being good people? Why don't we maintain a good relationship? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these things. There's a verse in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُفْصِرُونَ Pious people, when they feel like they're being misled by the shaytan, they remember. Once they remember, they begin to see clearly. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam has a hadith, it's beautiful. The hadith, I think, is narrated in Kitab al-Khisal by al-Shaykh al-Saduq, if I'm not mistaken. In this hadith, he says, ثَلَاثٌ مِنْ أَشَدِّ مَا عَمِلَ العباد. Three things are the most difficult things that the servants of Allah can do. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to explain the first two. What I want to mention is the third part. The Imam says, نعم. 
He says, وَذِكْرُ اللَّهِ عَلَى كُلِّ حال. One of the hardest things that a human can do is to remember Allah all the time. وَهُوَ أَنْ يَذْكُرَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عِنْدَ الْمَعْصِيَ يَهُمُّ بِهَا That you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever you have an, in, an intention to commit a sin. فَيَحُولُ ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ تِلْكَ الْمَعْصِيَةِ His remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blocks him from committing this sin. Wahwa qawlullah. Then the Imam recites this verse. Wahwa qawlullah. Inna alladheena taqaw idha massahum ta'ifun min al-shaytan tadhakkaru fa idha hum mubsirun. So this is the first thing. To remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why we are ordered not to be uh, holiday Muslims, as they say. You shouldn't be the, the type of people that only come to the center during Muharram. You shouldn't be the type of people that only come to the center during, during Shah Ramadan. You only go to the mosque during Salat al-Eid. Keep this relationship with, with Allah on good terms. Pray on time every single day. If you could pray the nawafil, the recommended prayers, do that. If you could, pray, if you could read Quran every single day, one scholar, some people might, might remember this, a scholar would insist on this, that you should, uh, because it was based on a hadith that he he mentioned that you should read Quran every single day, uh, a, a complete chapter, and give the rewards to Imam Zaman. Because the hadith says that whoever does this is with the Imam on the same level. So read Quran, and I guarantee, brothers and sisters, if you read Quran every single day, whatever you can, if you can read a single page, do it. If you can't, half a page, whatever. Read Quran and give the rewards to Imam Zaman. I guarantee you, you'll be amazed. You'll feel like God's gates of mercy are going to open in front of you. Read Quran. If you can read Ziyarat Ashura every single day, do that. If you could read the recommended du'as of every day, very short du'as, every single day has a short du'a and a short ziyara of the designated Imam of that day. This is very good. What this does is it keeps us in check. It keeps us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, one thing that a scholar would mention, a scholar, he passed away a long time ago, what he would say to his, to his children and grandchildren, very interesting. He said, always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate your status with dua, not with ibtila. Because eventually Allah, if he wanted to elevate you to a status, he's going to do that. But it's either with your own dua or by making you go through trials and tribulations. So inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to elevate our status with the tawfiq that he will give us inshallah to pray more and to do, uh, and to do dua more inshallah.